Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Star Theater. Hope you're all dressed warmly. A uh, beautiful morning outside. It's uh, kind of otherworldly, a nice time to talk about space travel. Uh, I'm Jonathan, your resident astronomer, and I'm here to talk with you today about uh, the new space race, what's going on in the uh, commercial space race, and what the vision is for the future. And so uh, just to give you a little grounding, what we're going to be covering today, it's, it's a complicated topic. These are the questions that I get asked a lot when uh, I'm asked to talk about uh, space. You know, how is space tourism different than what's been going on in commercial space flight? What does space mean? Where does space start even? Who's an astronaut? What is space tourism? And is this really just billionaires trying to show off and uh, outdo each other? All of these kind of things play into this. I'm going to try to dispel some of the myths, give you a little bit of um, grounding on this, and then talk about what the future actually looks like. So just to let you know, uh, you know the, 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 the race to conquer space is not new. Uh, this was one of the pictures from Apollo that never actually got published. The Vikings obviously got to the moon before uh, the rest of us did. They've gotten everywhere. Um, so. Yeah. They obviously were not able to successfully establish a colony just like in Vinland. But you know, where does commercial space start? You know, it, it, originally, it was, the space race was between the United States government and the Soviet Union's government. But uh, commercial companies have been playing in the space industry um, ever since the very beginning. Not only do you have the commercial companies building the rockets for the US uh, in, you know, in the case of uh, Mercury and, and Gemini, those were commercial companies and Apollo building those, those spacecraft, but was under gov government contract. But the actual first commercial space flight was Telstar, if you all remember Telstar back in the early 1960s. It was a, a, a communications satellite. This was the first commercially funded space flight. They, uh, they, it was a government rocket, but the uh, Telstar company, uh, RCA, uh, paid for, I believe it was RCA, paid for the, the, the rocket and launching Telstar in 1962, the first privately funded space launch. Uh, I was, in, in going back and looking over my notes on Telstar, I, I found out that the reason that it, it stopped working was actually because of a, uh, a, a government atomic, high altitude atomic test. The uh, electromagnetic pulse from the, radi from the uh, atomic explosion knocked out Telstar, which I, I thought was kind of ironic. So, uh, so we've, we've had commercial space uh, interest in putting up commercial satellites. The first actual people who went up as commercial space flight participants or people who were actually astronauts doing work in space started in the space shuttle program. And Charlie Walker, who's on the, um, on the, the left here, he's actually a Viking resident astronomer too. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to be on a, a trip with him. Uh, as, the, as the resident astronomer. He was the first person to go up as a private citizen on a spacecraft, a space flight mission. He had developed some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, experiments for McDonnell Douglas, and they figured rather than trying to train an astronaut to do it, since there's room on the space shuttle, you know, why not have the person who designed those experiments actually go up and fly those? And so he was able to do that uh, twice in the early space shuttle program. Another uh, commercial space flight participant, a payload specialist, was Greg Jarvis, who was supposed to have gone up on two previous space shuttle missions. He was supposed to go up in 1985, and Senator Jake Garn took his seat. And then he was supposed to go up in early 1986 on the flight before Challenger, and uh, Congressman Bill Nelson took his seat. So he was bumped to the Challenger mission in 1986. And he and uh, Krista McAuliffe, who we all know was, was going to be the first teacher in space, were two private citizens on the Challenger when it exploded. And so uh, that, you know, it was a terrible tragedy, obviously, but it also showed us that space was far from being operational. The space shuttle was not just going to be a, um, a tourist vehicle that people could get up on and fly around and, and come back and, and uh, you know, just be able to, to do touristic type of activity or even uh, you know, there was talk about flying Walter Cronkite at one point on the space shuttle to do, uh, it, it, very seriously, you know, they thought he would be the perfect person to go up there and report on what it was actually like to be in space. So it, it actually uh, was, was kind of the death of a, of a program that never got a lot of publicity, but there was talk about actually putting a, a commercial, almost like a bus, inside the back of the space shuttle. The space shuttle has a big, had a big cargo space that was the size of a school bus. 
and there was talk about putting this kind of um, pressurized module inside. There were up to, up to uh, 40 or 50 people could fly in the space shuttle inside the, the back of the cargo bay. Uh, this was the plan from 1983 when, when things became operational. Maybe the space shuttle could be used for, for space tourism. Obviously, it didn't happen as a result of Challenger. But um, the initial cost they were thinking was going to be somewhere around a million dollars per passenger to go up there. But if they did it repeatedly, they could bring the cost down to about $60,000 per flight. Again, never got off the drawing board, and probably a good thing that it didn't. But there's a, an artist's concept of what it would look like to be inside of that uh, that um, uh, pressurized module. So the actual first commercial space flights uh, started happening where you, where you had actual people paying to go up. Uh, Dennis Tito was the first actual space tourist. And uh, he flew in, uh, in uh, 2001. He paid $25 million for this flight. So Dennis Tito paid $25 million for a chance to fly on a Russian Soyuz rocket and went to the International Space Station. Um, he was, the, NASA was dead sent against him going up there because they felt he wasn't trained. Uh, they thought it, it, it kind of, uh, it was going to pose a safety hazard to people on the International Space Station. And so if you go and look through the NASA photo archives, there are no NASA photographs of Dennis Tito aboard the International Space Station. The only pictures that were taken up there were taken either by him or his Russian crewmates. Uh, so he did go up there. He, he, he stayed up there safely, came back again, and he was the first of many uh, space tourists who went up on the Russian rockets. They started selling those. Uh, Lance Bass was going to go up on one. Uh, Sarah Brightman, the singer, was going to go up on one, actually, um, as late as about uh, 10 years ago. But then there was a... a um, uh, a Soyuz launch abort where the, uh, the spacecraft had to make an emergency separation from the launch vehicle. She was scheduled to go up shortly after that and her family, uh, well she canceled because of family reasons was, was what was told. You know, obviously it, it would have been an interesting thing for her to go up there, but, it, but putting your families through something like that is, is a very tough um, thing to go through. You know, the Russians also did fly other people commercially. They flew Helen Sharman who had won a lottery in uh, 1991. She was an employee of Mars Candy Bar in the UK, and she flew in 1991 aboard a Russian rocket, went, to, um, went up to the Mir space station. And there was also a Japanese tourist named Toyohiro Akiyami who flew on Mir in 1990. But again, Dennis, he, Dennis Tito was the first person to pay for his own seat on there. And uh, there's actually a Japanese billionaire and his uh, film producer aboard the International Space Station right now. They actually paid for seats on the uh, Russian Soyuz to go up there. So space tourism was going on for a while with the Russians paying for the, uh, with the Russians funding that. They had to stop that after the Columbia accident in 2003 because NASA needed to be able to buy those seats on the Soyuz to take American astronauts to the space station. So that program was put on hold until the space shuttle started flying again. And then after 2011, when the space shuttle stopped flying and we didn't have a, a ability to launch American astronauts for, for eight years, uh, again, the commercial pro the uh, space tourist program was put on hold until um, uh, the Americans could start providing their own way back up into space again. So a couple other milestones in commercial space uh, was uh, this was the, the Ansari X Prize. There was a, a prize for the first company that was able to send uh, private astronauts uh, up into space on their own technology. And so um, uh, Bert Rutan and Scaled Composites came up with this design. It's, a, it's an airplane that drops, uh, the space, uh, spacecraft is actually hanging from below the aircraft here. And this was like the way the X-15 used to fly. It would, it would fly up to altitude, drop the spacecraft, and then it would take off and go up into suborbital flight. And so in 2003 and 2004, uh, this was the, the first uh, attempts at trying to win this. And Mike Melville, on June 21st, 2004, became the first private citizen to fly in a privately built spaceship up into uh, outer space. So this is the beginning now of possibility for commercial space program. Richard, Richard Branson 
uh, partnered with Virgin, uh, formed Virgin Galactic and partnered with Scale Composites and then built what is now becoming a commercial version of this to be able to fly up to six passengers at a time. Another big milestone in commercial spaceflight was SpaceX. Uh, when, when the um, US cons uh, canceled the Constellation program, which was supposed to be the follow-on to the space shuttle, uh, we decided to go with a, what they called the Commercial Crew Program, which was allowing commercial companies to develop technologies that would help take people into low Earth orbit. NASA decided to redefine its mission so that NASA would be focused on the moon and beyond uh, for building spacecraft and rockets to go to, from the moon to beyond for astronauts and would let private companies do things in low Earth orbit, that is, taking people up to the International Space Station. And so they awarded contracts to SpaceX and also to Boeing to start developing this capability. Uh, SpaceX became the first company to build its own rocket that could get in, into orbit itself. So this was the Falcon 1 that finally made it, after I think it was four or five attempts, finally made it into, into orbit. And so SpaceX became the first private company to build their own orbital spacecraft. So this gets into, this is just a little bit of background on, on commercial developments in outer space, and we'll now start getting into space tourism. And the question that starts coming up, and we heard this a lot at the beginning of the, uh, the year, especially the middle of the year when the race between Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin started uh, really heating up. And people ask a lot, where does space actually start? There is no real um, fine, like you, you can't say that the atmosphere just stops at one place and begins somewhere else. Um, and so the Air Force and the FAA say that the, the altitude, what they consider to be space, is 50 miles above the Earth's surface and above. Uh, the International um, Federa Aeronautic Federation says that it's 62 miles, which, or 100 kilometers. Again, you can see these are round numbers and very arbitrary. There's no real clear-cut dividing line between uh, the atmosphere and outer space. The atmosphere just gets thinner and thinner. Uh, you may hear somebody talk about the Kármán line, and what this is was a theoretical point at which uh, anything that's going to stay aloft, you can't possibly have wings that will generate enough lift to keep that thing aloft. It has to rely on its own kinetic energy, the energy from the launch. And so at about 62 miles, the atmosphere becomes too thin that wings could hold anything up in the air, and you have to rely on it having some sort of propulsion to get it there. So that's why, the, that's why we have this definition of somewhere between 50 to 62 miles of altitude for where space begins. And so and then we also get into what's the difference between suborbital flight and orbital flight. Suborbital means basically you just go up high enough to get above that Kármán line and come back down again. You, you fire a rocket for usually two or three minutes, gives you just enough push to, to uh, to, when it cuts off, you keep coasting up and then gradually just cross over that line and then fall back to Earth again. So all you're interested in doing is just crossing that line. You don't care about staying up there. And that's the way that the commercial space flight right now with uh, Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic are doing. They give you just enough boost to get you above 50 miles. You're uh, up there for three or four minutes and then you start coming back down again. And we started doing this with the, B50, the, uh, excuse me, the X-15 program, which was dropped from a B-52 back in, uh, this is in the 1960s. It was a research vehicle that, the, uh, that NASA and the Air Force used. You know, again, the B-52 would take this up to altitude, drop the X-15, it would fire its engines for uh, a, a, couple, uh, a couple of minutes at most, give it just enough boost that it got up over that, uh, that line. And so a number of Air Force pilots became astronauts as a result of uh, flying the X-15. And this is the same technology that I mentioned that Virgin Galactic uses. So now they've got what they call the White Knight 2 and then their, their spaceship uh, Unity right now, which hangs below it. And this can take you, uh, this will fly up to about 50,000 feet. The, the uh, spacecraft, the, the, uh, the, the tourists are going, they're sitting inside the spacecraft and it drops and then fires its engine like this and takes off. And so it gives you just enough boost that it gets you up above that Kármán line. And then the wings uh, do uh, this, this interesting maneuver. The wings fold up to kind of uh, aerodynamically control the vehicle, and it, they're calling it feathering. And then as it, as it starts gliding back down, the wings come back out, and it lands like a glider. 
And so this is what Richard Branson, this is uh, Richard Branson in the front here and his, his crew were doing when they did the first uh, official commercial space flight in, uh, in the Unity earlier this year. You can see that they're, they're not wearing parachutes, they're not wearing pressure suits, they don't have face masks on. There are two pilots who are flying this, a pilot and a co-pilot, and the passengers sit in the back here and they get a few minutes of weightlessness and get a chance to look out the window and see what's going on below them. They get to see the blackness of space and then come back down again. And they land uh, like this. It lands like a glider. There's no engine. It just circles and comes back in. There was a, a problem on this one that uh, wasn't, wasn't discussed until after, or after the flight was over, but the FAA pointed out that they did not follow their flight plan. They didn't accelerate at the right angle, and so they went out of the controlled airspace. And uh, there was something that uh, Virgin had to, had to correct later on. Uh, and it also came out later on, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not trying to poo-poo any of these different technologies. I just want to try to be realistic about what they also have in, uh, what they also have in terms of risk as well as reward. Uh, the, the first test flight they did of this uh, before they sent up the, the commercial uh, passengers, they noted that uh, there was a seal on the back of the wings that actually blew, uh, started to blow out during the course of the flight, and the safety engineer for Virgin Galactic, who was subsequently let go, um, said he was amazed that the vehicle made it back without killing everybody on board because th that the wing didn't come apart. And so after this, after this first flight with uh, Branson, he was going to start flying people later that year. And now, now Virgin Galactic has decided to continue more test flights and not start doing commercial flights with more passengers until uh, towards the end of next year. So they're trying to pay attention to safety here, but again, this is, I, I think it's a very complicated technology. The astronauts who I've talked to about this say, you know, they really want to see uh, a little bit more about how this works before they'd be willing to go up there themselves in a, in a spacecraft like this. Although I've also talked to several NASA scientists who have experiments that are going to be flying on this and who have actually been training to fly on, on Virgin Galactic as well. So. It's up to you to decide what kind of risk you're willing to accept when you go up there. But that's, that's one technology for getting you into space. The other one that uh, uh, flew very shortly after that was uh, Blue Origin's New Shepard spacecraft. And this is a, a, the other way to get into, uh, into uh, a, a ballistic flight. And this is just like Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom flew in 1961. They were, uh, Gus Grissom and, and Alan Shepard flew on a Redstone rocket, which gave them just enough boost to get them up 100 miles and then come back down. In this case, they, they had a little bit of launching out over the ocean because they wanted to make sure it was safe for uh, people on the ground. If there was going to be a problem with it, they wanted it to happen out over the ocean, not, uh, not over land. So there was a little bit more of a horizontal boost to this than uh, what we have with New Shepard. New Shepard uh, that... Uh, Blue Origin launches, launches out of Texas. Uh, the booster, uh, with, with Mercury, only the capsule came back. The booster was lost at, at sea. With Blue Origin, both the, uh, the booster and the capsule are, are recoverable. And so they named this their, their New Shepard because it follows the same type of flight plan that the original Alan Shepard did. And so you had Alan Shepard flying on, uh, on the Redstone, and then just last week, his daughter, Laura Shepard Churchley flew on Blue Origin. So, um, yeah, it was wh while we were on our trip, she, f she flew on Blue Origin. So, uh, just uh, amazing. I, I had a chance to meet her a couple of years ago, and she's a, a fantastic person. But uh, here's how the Blue Origin works. Again, it launches, this, in this case, Blue Origin launches almost straight up. They separate, the capsule keeps going up, the booster comes back down, fires and lands, and then the capsule comes down and lands softly all uh, on the desert and within the area of Blue Origin's uh, launch facility. So this is what their flight looks like. Now, on the Blue Origin spacecraft, there, are, there is no pilot. And the, ast the astronauts or the space flight participants, there are six of them in there. Uh, they're, they're flying without spacesuits on, without space helmets or anything like that. You accelerate like this, um, going up pretty much straight up. You're pulling about three Gs when you're going up, so three times the force of gravity as you're going up in this uh, spacecraft. 
and I'm not going to show the entire flight here, but uh, what happens again, when it gets after the engine burns out after a couple of minutes, they separate, uh, the capsule comes back down, and it's going to look like a big, uh, like it crashes here, but actually what's happening is it's firing jets that slow it down right as it's about to touch down so that you have a very um, soft touchdown. That's the same technology that the Russians use for Soyuz. Uh, one thing to point out is that it hasn't always worked on Soyuz. There's been a couple of incidents where the capsule came down and those jets didn't fire in time and cosmonauts broke their teeth as a result of uh, the hard landing on the desert floor in, in, uh, in Russia. So just, again, something else to pay attention to in case you're thinking about flying on this. Make sure you're, you've got a mouth guard or something on. But uh, this is what the inside of the Blue Shepherd capsule looks like. Uh, again, the, you know, they, they make a big point of having the big windows here that you can see out of when you, you go up on your flight. And so again, it's going straight up, coming back down again. Now, what's the difference between suborbital and orbital? Well, orbital means that you actually get enough speed to get into orbit around the Earth. And instead of going straight up and coming back down, the idea here is you get up, you, you start taking off until you get uh, substantially above the heaviest part of the Earth's atmosphere, like about 50 or 60,000 feet up. And then the, the rocket tilts over, and the idea is to go horizontally as fast as you can until you start going about 17,000 miles an hour. And when you hit that 100-kilometer limit there, the first stage falls off, and a second stage of the engine fires, which gives you enough velocity to keep going forward. And then eventually, you get into orbit around the Earth, and you can stay up there then as long as you need to, anywhere from one orbit to staying up there indefinitely. And so we've got the commercial crew program for NASA is all around building this orbital capability, which is to be able to get into orbit, to be able to bring supplies to the International Space Station, or to take astronauts to the International Space Station. And so there are two companies that are providing that capability. Uh, one is SpaceX, the other is Boeing, and they're uh, building their Starliner. They're still having some issues with getting the technology working right. They were supposed to have flown last year and then they've been having some, uh, some issues. Their test flight did not work right. They didn't do end-to-end -end testing of the software, and the, uh, as a result, the uh, spacecraft used up all of its maneuvering fuel before it even got into orbit. And now the, the second test flight, they were having problems with valves that were sticking, so that one's still going back and, and being revised, but eventually this is going to be another way of getting to the International Space Station through the Boeing Starliner and a United Launch Alliance booster. SpaceX has been doing really well in this regard. They've got their Dragon spacecraft, which uh, is, is uh, also fully reusable. The only part of the SpaceX uh, that, that's not reusable, with Boeing, the only part of the, of the spacecraft that's reusable is just the actual capsule itself. The rest of the booster uh, falls back to Earth and burns up. With SpaceX, we've seen them land their boosters before. The second stage is not reusable, but the capsule is reusable. And so the Dragon capsule uh, will fly, can fly up, and the nose opens up to reveal a docking hatch, and it can dock with the International Space Station. And it can also fly commercial passengers. Uh, if, if for those of you who remember it back in September, the Inspiration 1 mission or, uh, flew four, uh, four non-astronauts. These were the first all, um, all uh, non-professional space pr uh, astronauts going up there flying a mission like this, and they stayed in space for three days and had a chance to, uh, to experience what it was like to be in orbit for that long a period of time. And uh, they actually, they put a, uh, instead of having the docking hatch, they had a, a, a hemispherical clear bubble that they could look out of while they were flying around the, uh, the Earth. So this is a way that you could potentially get people up there. You, know, you will notice the difference between this and the other ones is these people are all wearing pressure suits. They have space helmets on. And uh, you know, so they do have, uh, if anything were to go wrong while they're in orbit, they have a fighting chance to get back again. Uh, again, not saying that anything could go wrong with, with the Blue Origin or the Virgin Galactic, but if you're not wearing a space suit, if there's the slightest leak in the uh, cabin, at the, and the spacecraft depressurizes, you can be dead within about 10 seconds. Uh, and that actually happened to a Russian crew. Uh, their spacecraft depressurized. They didn't have enough room 
uh, in the original design of the Soyuz for three astronauts, three cosmonauts to be wearing their spacesuits and sitting side by side. So they flew without spacesuits and they had a, a valve that accidentally popped open as it was about to re-enter and the, the spacecraft depressurized and they all died uh, very quickly as a result of that. So uh, I, I wrote a, an editorial earlier this year that we really need to start thinking about how we regulate uh, this kind of thing. Right now the FAA only regulates are you flying within approved airspace and you, do you, public, do you for, uh, pose a hazard to the public on the ground. So I think we need to be thinking more about, as, as more and more people want to, to take these kind of missions, you need to be thinking about the kind of risks that you're signing up for and are you doing what you possibly can to support and protect these people when they go up. So uh, you know, when I talk about things being a possible risk, yes, it looks operational. This was the big, uh, the big headache that NASA kept learning with the space shuttle program is that every time you think things have gotten routine or that you've, you've figured out everything that could possibly go wrong, there's something else in the system that can come out and get you. And uh, this was a, a ground test of the SpaceX capsule. Uh, this was after it had successfully come back from a cargo mission and they were testing out the escape system after it got back on the ground. And as soon as they pressurized the escape system, which was supposed to save the astronauts, it blew up the space capsule. Um, and so, uh, again, this was, this was a, a it, was, it was as a result of hypergolic material leaking back into the valves. They'd never had that happen on any previous space, space mission before. But when you're talking about the kind of explosive capabilities that are, that are uh, or, you know, the very explosive fuels that you're carrying on a spacecraft, that kind of thing can happen. And then there was, uh, there was this accident in 2014 with Virgin Galactic as they were testing things out. Uh, this was a test flight and 13 seconds into the flight, the, the pilot accidentally, the co-pilot accidentally unlocked the wings and, and the thing pitched up immediately and uh, it disintegrated in flight. The, uh, the co-pilot was killed and the, the, uh, the pilot came back and this was just uh, show you what way he was describing this. You know, basically said, you know, the thing just violently pitched, they were already going more than a thousand miles an hour when this happened. Um, pressed into the harnesses so violently, our heads were almost pushed into our laps. A loud bang occurred, followed by sounds similar to paper fluttering in the wind, which was the cabin being torn apart. Uh, he fell out, he fell out in his, um, in his seat, he was able to regain consciousness in time to separate himself from his seat and fire his, uh, his uh, parachute. The co-pilot did not regain consciousness and, and, and crashed. Um, but this was the result of that. Uh, it, you know, it caused them to go back and do some redesign so that they couldn't accidentally deploy the wings uh, during the space fl flight. But again, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with technologies and the more complicated the technologies get, the more I th risk gets built into the system. And so uh, just, just to you know, kind of sober you up before you sign up for one of these things, what are you signing up for? How do you do tell your families that what you're doing is worth the risk that you're taking for, for a, uh, what could be a joyride? And the pilot, uh, who, or the co-pilot who died, his name is now on the, the NASA Space Mirror, which is a monument in the, uh, at Kennedy Space Center to astronauts who've passed away in the course of, uh, of their official duties. So there was a big debate with the Astronaut Memorial Foundation who runs the Space Mirror. Should this guy be, uh, be put on there with other NASA astronauts who had lost their lives in the course of duty? And it was decided since he was actually trying to help advance technology and was killed in the line of duty that they would put his name on the Space Mirror at Kennedy Space Center. But uh, they, they, this caused them to come up with the definition now that this should only be for people who were killed in the line of duty as uh, active uh, people who are flying the mission. Uh, and the idea, is, of course, is you don't want to fill this mirror up. You don't want any more names on this mirror at all. But then the debate came up as we started getting ready to have the commercial space flight. What do you call people who fly in outer space? Are they astronauts? Are they, who's an astronaut? Who's a payload specialist? Who's a commercial astronaut? Who's a tourist? Who's a space flight participant? And, you know, NASA and the military and the FAA can award astronaut wings. They're the only official bodies that can uh, award astronaut wings. The FAA has just said in this last week that they're getting out of the business. 
Uh, originally, th they had come up with the definition that anybody who flew above 50 miles was going to be an astronaut. Then they came up with a definition that said that you had to demonstrate activities during the flight that were essential to public safety or contributing to human spaceflight safety. And finally, they've decided now that, that so many people are going to start going into space that they'll grandfather in everybody who flew this year, but starting January 1st, going forward, there will no longer be any commercial space wings awarded to uh, space flight participants who go up on commercial vehicles. Now, so again, what's the difference between a tourist and a participant and, uh, you know, somebody who's really making something of the, of the flight here? And what I want you to do is, I'm sure you remember that William Shatner flew earlier this year on Blue Origin. I, I would like you to watch the difference between some of the other people who were on this mission with William Shatner, how they're reacting after this flight, and then how he reacted after this flight. Just listen to this for a few minutes you know what, my, Get my, here, people! The impression I have that I never ex expected to have is you're shooting up. Give me a pain bottle. Come here. I want one. I want to hear this. Here. You want a little of this? <laughs> so Jeff Bezos is spraying everybody with champagne, and William Shatner is standing here, obviously just completely transfixed by what happened to him. He doesn't want any part of that. Champagne showers have begun. Smiles all around. William Shatner taking in the moment clearly. <laughs> what you have built. Everybody in the world needs to do this. Everybody in the world needs to see the obstacles. Oh it was unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, you know, the, the little things of weightlessness. But to see the blue cover go whip by and now you're staring into black. That's the thing. The covering of blue, this, this sheet, this blanket, this, com this comforter of blue that we have around us. We think, oh, it's blue sky. And then suddenly you shoot through it all of a sudden, as though you whip off a sheet off you when you're asleep. And you're looking into blackness, into black ugliness. And you look down, and there's the blue down there, and the black up there. And it's, it's just, there is mother and... Earth and comfort, and there's, is there death? I don't know. Is that death? Is that the way death is? Whoop, and it's gone. Wow. So, Salvat, obviously, somebody who was deeply affected by what he saw, and he's, people I've talked to that have talked to him after this said he's, he's still, obviously, a very changed man as a result of his experience. And I hope that all of you have had, as part of your voyages with Viking, uh, a, a transformative moment like this where you suddenly, it, it shatters your whole view of how you've lived your life and how you've thought about yourself. This is the kind of thing that we hope to see with more space tourism, with the people who are able to now share that experience with the rest of the world. And in, in working with Eileen Collins on her book, um, she, after she finished her fourth mission, she decided to retire. She could have stayed on with NASA for another, as long as she wanted to, and fly more missions. But she said at the time that she retired, there were still 50 astronauts in the astronaut corps who had never flown a mission. And she decided that it was much more important for those people to get a chance to fly so that they could share that perspective, both what they learned technically as well as what they saw about the Earth. It was much more important to get 50 more astronauts up in the air than for her to keep flying again. So, you know, be thinking about how your experiences have been changing you how you share your perspective with other people, and how can other people benefit from what you've had the chance to do that they may never get a chance to do themselves. So that comes to the difference between tourism and exploration, and now we're starting to get into the next wave. What goes beyond what SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic have done so far with tourism? How do we take this to the next level, and what's the, vi the vision that's going on? And so we've got the Saturn V, which is the fourth from the right here, the, the previous most uh, uh, powerful rocket built by humanity. We've now got the Artemis uh, program that's building. SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin are, are thinking much larger 
term. It's not just billionaires playing with their toys at this point. There is actually a vision behind that. And so Jeff Bezos' uh, vision for New or Blue Origin is that he wants to benefit Earth by taking uh, humanity out into space to explore, find new energy and material resources. Ultimately, what he wants to do is to take all of the polluting industries on Earth and move them into space. We need to, his, his view is to, is to protect Earth by getting all the pollution, uh, the, the polluting industries out into space and literally have millions of people working either in orbit or on the moon. And so that's part of what, that's what he wants to do in the long term. And in getting there, uh, his, his new Glenn spacecraft will help move him in that direction. There are some things, uh, technologies that have already been working on right now. One of them is, is expandable uh, space modules. These are inflatable. They've got, they've got a test one on the side of the International Space Station right now. Uh, but he is now looking at, uh, he just announced last, uh, in October, the Orbital Reef, or the Blue Reef, which is a completely privately funded space station. Uh, the po partners would be Boeing, uh, who's got their, uh, their uh, Starliner spacecraft on there, Sierra Nevada, who had this space plane that didn't win the uh, commercial crew program. But he would build this private laboratory uh, it's, it's a, both a laboratory and a tourist destination. You'd be able to rent laboratory space on this if you were a researcher. If you were a space tourist and you wanted to go up there, you could go up and stay for a week or two. Uh, this is what the inside would look like. Eileen Collins said, obviously, they must have a, a, a big cleaning crew to go up there with them because the inside of a space station never looks that pristine. But, uh, so this is, this is Jeff Bezos' vision for the immediate future. He's looking to have this built before the end of this decade. And, you know, con conceivably, you could be working up towards space hotels for people to go up there, you know, as a, as a destination for working and, and, and living in space. But ultimately, he would see something like this, where we're actually doing mining on the moon and uh, uh, bringing those resources back to Earth rather than continuing to strip mine here in the Earth. So that's Jeff Bezos' vision of, uh, of the future for uh, what he's working towards. Uh, SpaceX is working towards something else. Elon Musk says we have basically two choices. We can stay on Earth forever and wait for the next big extinction event, like the one that killed the dinosaurs, or we can become a spacefaring society and become a multi-planetary species. And so he started building now his, uh, uh, his Starship. And of course, we saw a number of the, of the test flights of that this year, but he's, he's, he's gone much more public now with actually doing the test flights live where people can watch them. And, you know, it used to be very secretive in terms of the, how they were doing things. Blue Origin is still keeping its program very secretive, although they've now built the largest launch pad at Kennedy, uh, at, at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, it is now a Blue Origin launch pad, and they're going to be starting to launch later this year, I think, or next year. But uh, SpaceX is working towards developing its Starship, which was, uh, will probably fly early next year. They've won the contract to, uh, to build a lunar lander based on the Starship technology. And so this is what uh, SpaceX is working towards. When we go back to the moon, now set for 2025, it'll be uh, landing in a SpaceX uh, Starship. So the Starship, as, uh, as Elon Musk sees it, is a pretty flexible vehicle. It can be used to, the first thing he wants to do with it is to launch a lot of uh, more of his Starlink satellites into orbit. But the interior of it can be configured a lot of different ways. And here's an artist's conception of what um, uh, a, a flight would be uh, that could take potentially 64 passengers up to visit the ISS. So this is what the inside might look like. Again, this is not officially SpaceX, but this is a way that uh, uh, some people have, have kind of envisioned it. The first level would be a cargo storage area. Then you've got a, a spacesuit area where you can make uh, spacewalks from. And then there's the uh, there's two levels of crew quarters. Makes your stateroom look pretty big, doesn't it? Uh, and then they've got the exercise facility and showers and uh, the, uh, the restrooms. And then finally, uh, you have the galley area. This is the world ca the above the world cafe. And then above that would be the control area. But so this is, this is an idea about how you might be able to configure the inside of a starship like this. And you could either take people into low Earth orbit with it, or you could fly all the way to Mars. And that's uh, what, what his concept is right now, is that it, uh, Elon Musk wants to, he's, he's doing the moon landing as a way to fund 
uh, his, his actual dream, which is to take humanity to Mars. And he's trying to leapfrog NASA and uh, hopes to get uh, a, a, actually a privately funded uh, Mars colony started by the end of the 2020s. So he, he views the, the initial steps as being la landing two of these starships that are loaded with cargo, landing those on Mars, and then sending two more of these that are loaded with people to land there and then start building a, a colony based on the uh, materials that they brought with them. And so uh, eventually this is what you start with. You start with these landing facilities for the starships and then over the course of a number of decades, you eventually end up with a Mars colony that looks something like this, a Mars city. His estimates are that if we spent somewhere around if, uh, uh, one fifth of the uh, Earth's gross domestic product, we could have this kind of thing going on on Mars by the 2050s. Again, that's, that's a substantial investment of, of money to make that kind of thing happen, but he sees it as being a very real possibility. So seven to 10 years uh, after, the, after the people have first started landing, this starts taking place uh, and, the, and the city starts taking shape. So the question becomes, who's going to fly these missions? Who is going to go to Mars? Basically, what you're looking at is, are you signing up to colonize there? Are you basically taking it over? Or are you actually going to be, you know, are you colonizing it with the idea we conquer Mars and then I come back home? Or are you actually migrating there? Is the idea that you're going to go there and stay there? How do you deal with death? It's almost inevitable if you have 100 people flying on one of these spaceships for nine months to get you to Mars, what happens if somebody dies along the way? Do you do a burial at sea? Do you, do you preserve them? Do you use them for raw materials? You know, there's, I mean, these are, these are real questions you're going to have to think about along this kind of trip. Uh, we can't take our wasteful consumption habits with us. You know, what happens if you have a, a situation like the Martian where there's, they feel like they're stranded? Do you succumb? There's going to be inevitable media pressure to try to do a rescue mission. And, you know, if something does go wrong, do you succumb to that kind of pressure? Or do you just say that's just part of what happens when you colonize a new world? That sometimes things are going to go wrong, we'll learn from it, and we'll keep, keep trying. Uh, what's the relationship with Earth going to be like? There's all kinds of science fiction built up around this. Do you, you know, does the governmental structure that we have here on Earth work when you go out to uh, uh, a colony of, of a couple hundred people or a couple thousand people? What does what you're doing do to benefit people back on Earth? That's the big question. The technologies that you're developing to take to Mars have to be something that's going to help people out back on Earth. For example, um, you know, if you're, if you're developing if you're developing a terraforming technology to help transform Mars's atmosphere, why don't you use that back on Earth to help counteract the, the, um, the, the effects of climate change? You know, we need to be able to use that same type of, te type of technology back here on Earth. And that's ultimately, you know, what happened with the Apollo program is a lot of the technologies we use every day now as part of our regular lives. But again, thinking about what does it mean to take this trip to, to Mars, you know, is it going to be like a Viking settlement in Iceland where a couple people go there with the expectation of staying there and eventually these colonies start building up? You know, the, there was the failed attempt at colonizing America. Uh, there's the, we have the lessons from Jamestown and from the, from the pilgrims. You know, both in Jamestown and, in, and at, at Plymouth Colony, more than half the colonists died in the first year. Uh, there were only, I think, after, at Plymouth, there were only, I think, four, four married women left after the first year. Um, it, 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 it just, you know, it's one of those things that you have to accept that, that this is going to be a very hazardous type of thing, but it's part of establishing a new life for you. And so what do our colonies start looking like? You know, this is when NASA talks about building a pr permanent presence on the moon, this is kind of what the vision looks like right now. But if the idea, again, is to be thinking about building a permanent presence, how do you start expanding this and how do you start dealing with the hazards? Living on the moon is going to be a piece of cake compared to being on Mars. Uh, Mars is, uh, you know, you're talking about an 18-month round trip at least there and back again. If anything goes wrong, you're completely out of touch with what's going on back on the Earth. If something goes wrong on the moon, you're three days away from home. And chances are you can, you can get back again or you can have somebody come and bring you resources. So it's the kind of things that we have to think about. Uh, right now, we're at the starting point for expeditions. We just think about what you saw in Punta Arenas and Ushaya as being the starting places for expeditions to conquer Antarctica. As recently as the last century, explorers were setting out to, to go across Antarctica 
knowing that they might never come back again, and the government and the public were willing to let them do that. So think about now, would the public let several hundred people go off on what might be a suicide mission to colonize Mars right now? But think about, you know, again, what the pilgrims thought when they came to Pilgrim Rock, uh, uh, Pilgrim Rock. They didn't think about going back home again. They came here to set up a, a colony in the New World, and that was the only way you can make things sustainable is to is keep sending people there and eventually just take a foothold. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we up to the challenge as a species to do this kind of thing? The technology isn't that far off, but have we become too complacent and too comfortable? Let's think about that, and I'm looking forward to discussing this over, over drinks with you sometime. So thanks for coming today.